Isabel, I'm just checking if you are ready. We cannot hear you. You are unmuted, Ms. Schnabel. If you could uh, try to reconnect your audio uh, on WebEx. If it's still connected, please disconnect and then try to reconnect again. I've asked my colleague from DGIS to, to support you if he sees this. David, maybe you want to already share your slides. Do you have slides? We can see your screen. If you can just pull up the slides somehow there, they, yeah, there you, you go. See the whole screen? Yes. Yeah. If you could oh. uh, full screen the slides. Oh, yes, sorry. There you go. Thank you. Thank you. Um. I have to unmute. I'm sorry. Uh, wait a second. We can hear you. Oh, you can. And am I, am, am I waiting for? Uh... We, we're waiting. We're waiting for Isabel okay. for her introductory remarks. Thank you. Uh, let's give it one more minute. Um, otherwise, I will. I will be the imperfect substitute. I'm sorry for interrupting. I think Miss Isabel's is muted from the keyboard on the laptop. If she can double check that, please. Isabel, can you hear us? Uh, we cannot hear you. Um, Isabel, is it okay if I go ahead with your introductory remarks then? Yeah? Or while well, you try to reconnect? Okay, I, I do that then. So uh, I'm very sorry for that, David, and everyone else on the call. Um, Ms. Schnabel was, of course, supposed to welcome you, and uh, we are facing some technical difficulties. So. Uh, this is this lecture will be live streamed. So while the colleagues are gonna get ready to uh, switch on the live stream, I will do a very short uh, introductory words uh, about uh, Professor Sharstein. So uh, today, David will speak about the structure of financial systems, in particular, 
the relative importance of the banking sector and capital markets and the role of pension systems as well as financial regulation. Uh, this is a topic that is of great interest uh, also to the ECB. And in spite of the attempts to foster market-based finance, the European financial system remains very much bank-based and pay-as-you-go pension systems may play a role in that. Progress on Capital Markets Union, which aims to foster a well-developed and integrated European capital market, has been relatively slow. Uh, and it is uh, against this background that we are very much looking forward to uh, listening to Professor Sharstein's lecture, which is exactly on these topics and learning from his wisdom. So, David, the floor is now yours, and this will be live streamed. Uh, we have one hour. Thank you very much, uh, Luke. It's it's really a pleasure to uh, to be able to do this, and I'm very grateful for the opportunity. Um, of course, I wish we could all be together uh, and interact um, more informally as well. Um, so I'm going to cover a, a fairly wide range of topics today. Um, some of them are going to be, you know, quite high level. Uh, others uh, are quite specific, but they're all going to relate in some way to the question of why our financial systems are the way they are uh, and what we might expect um, in the future. So I'm going to start um, by describing the growth of finance in the U.S. Um, what actually happened to make finance such a large sector of the U.S. economy, uh, much larger than it is for, for most European countries. And then I'll compare um, the U.S. to France, um, just to get us started, both in the size of the financial sector uh, and in its structure. Um, and I'm going to take a corporate finance perspective and um, a household finance perspective. And I'm going to argue that some of the key differences that we see across countries um, are related to their pension policies, specifically the fact that some countries like France operate on a pay as you go uh, pension system, uh, where of course the younger generation um, pays for the uh, retirements of the, of, of the older uh, generation, while others um, like the United States uh, are more reliant uh, on privately funded uh, pension schemes where um, pension plans with some combination of um, contributions from employers and employees um, acquire assets over time to fund an employee's retirement. And I'll argue that these asset purchases to fund retirement have led the financial systems of countries like the U.S. to be um, more market-oriented, while countries like France that are more PAYGO-oriented are more reliant on banks and non-market uh, forms of finance. And as I said, I'll explore some of the other implications for the corporate and household sector. Okay, then I'll talk um, about how taking this perspective was on how European and US systems might evolve over time, um, whether, for example, they might converge or um, diverge in terms of their approach to finance. And then the rest of the talk is going to uh, focus on some of the challenges of the market-based system of finances, uh, finance challenges that I think have become painfully clear uh, in the current crisis, which I will also discuss. And along the way, I'll provide some perspectives on fintech um, as a kind of variant of somewhere in between the market-based system and the bank-based system. In any case, I hope you'll bear with me on this uh, this, this journey, I'm going to go from Bismarck, the founder of the modern pension system, to a uh, discussion of the bond basis. So um, we're going to cover, um, you know, a reasonable amount of territory. Okay, so um, here's a picture um, uh, that um, shows the growth of finance um, in the U.S. Um, starting in 1963 to today. If you went back to um, pre-Great Depression, you would see, you know, a pretty sizable financial sector that then collapses during the Great Depression, kind of slowly recovers. Um, and then um, it's, you, you can see it a little bit here, really accelerates um, its growth in the 1980s through the 1990s, of course, 
um, during the global financial crisis takes a big hit and then kind of climbs back up to levels that had existed before um, the, the financial crisis. And so this is um, based on work um, with um, Robin Greenwood, a uh, colleague of mine, on uh, a paper we did, um, it's related to a paper we did earlier, um, in which we tried to figure out, well, just the mechanical question of like, what, what was driving the growth of finance? And what you see, I think, in this picture is that, um, and I'll unpack this a little bit more, is that insurance and credit intermediation relatively stable, but what really grew from the 80s was the security sector. Um, and so we, we, we wanted to understand a little bit about what's going on that's kind of driving this growth. And so um, this is a picture that, that we put together. This just goes through 2007. I haven't updated it to the, to the recent period. I think the story is, is fairly similar. And our conclusion is that asset management um, is a big driver of growth in the security sector. From almost nothing in 1980, so that's the kind of bottom shaded area, um, from almost nothing in 1980 to, you know, a, a much more significant piece of, um, uh, of this. So this is revenues as a percentage of GDP. I should have said that the um, prior slide was uh, was value added of the financial sector. So, you know, profits plus plus wages um, and and as as a share of GDP. And so securities was a was a big component of that value added growth. Um, and so a large part of its traditional asset management, what we think of as traditional now, like mutual funds and uh, and the like. Um, and the another piece that grew um, dramatically starting in the kind of 1990s was alternative asset management. So private equity, venture capital, um, hedge fund um, activity. And so, you know, what you can um, what you can see is that you can see that piece of the piece of the growth um, of the sector. So I want to come back. The asset management piece is going to is going to be quite relevant in what I talk about when we talk about pensions. Um, but that that's an important component of the growth in, in the US. The, the second um, observation we make is that um, the bottom two shaded areas are the kind of imputed measure of traditional bank based credit intermediation. So think of that as the, you know, the, the value of deposit taking and the value of lending just on balance sheet for banks. And that piece has, you know, from 1980, has basically declined as a share of GDP. Um, whereas if you look at the top shaded areas, what you see is that um, a big piece of it is um, providing you know, um, services to households in the form of mortgage origination and other consumer related fees. So it's not it's not on balance sheet, but it's fees related to um, refinancing mortgages, originating a mortgage and so on, and a bunch of other consumer related fees related to say transactions. Um, and then the final piece is this, is this output from um, securitization and the fees associated um, with securitization. And what's going on here is that um, business borrowing is not really driving any of the growth in credit intermediation. What's really driving it is provision of services to households, and it's largely household credit, largely um, mortgages, which grow dramatically as a share of GDP. I don't have the slide here, but if you if you plot the two, you see very dramatic growth in in uh, in household credit. Now those. Those two aspects are going to figure prominently in what I talk about with respect to uh, pension policy. So this is now just comparing um, the U.S. to to France. This is this is the finance share of GDP in the U.S. and France. And what you see is that in 1991, um, you know, France is, has a lower share uh, of value added from finance. U.S. has higher. 
Um, they start diverging. Um, the crisis comes in 2008, both finance shares decrease, um, and then they go back on their somewhat divergent paths. Okay, and so France's financial system, at least measured on a value added basis, is smaller than it is for the US, and that's um, not universally true in continental Europe relative to the US, but it's true for a bunch of countries. And so, um, just as a um, uh, to further the comparison, so what you see is the in in 2009. This is now I'm sorry 2014. So this is a bit stale data. 2014. What you see is the U.S. You know had this finance share of 7.3 percent of GDP. France is 4.5. And then I've written out some other characteristics of these two um, financial systems. One is um, on the corporate finance side. Um, the U.S. companies, you know, use uh, issue debt, bond debt more frequently than than France, or it's a larger share of their corporate borrowing. Um, uh, U.S. small firm share of employment, so this is like one to nine employees, is only 10.2 percent of employment. In France, it's 31 percent, and. Um, a much larger share of French companies um, have a um, uh, the, the the average insider ownership share is 52% versus a lower number for um, for the U.S. On the household finance side, what you see is that U.S. Um, households have higher financial assets relative to GDP. They have less of their wealth, less the less of their financial assets is in deposits at banks relative to the French households and household debt is um, higher in the US than it is in France. And so, th so there's some interesting um, differences across these uh, two countries and I think it's worth thinking a little bit more about why. And the fact that, that asset management grew so much in the US um, made me sort of think about uh, pension policy. And the French and the Americans have a very different um, approach to uh, pensions. You can see that private pension assets in the US are 152% of GDP in 2014, 10.5% in France, much lower. So the private pension is just not a uh, nearly as big a deal in France uh, as it is in the US. And of course, the reason is the pay-as-you-go pension system in France, where you're paying into that system and then taking money out when you retire. And that's a much more important part of the, of the retirement system for the French. And so this kind of le leads me to think about, well, what implications does that have? Can that explain some of the differences? And, you know, the, the, um, this is just a chart showing that, you know, there, you can divide countries based on their pay-go, pay-as-you-go, versus a private funded pension system where you're putting away money for um, retirement. And so, you know, the typical, you know, France, Italy, uh, Spain, Portugal, Greece, these are um, very much pay as you go pension systems. Um, those are on the right uh, lower side of the graph, let's call it the, the, the Southeast. And in the Northwest side of the graph, you've got, um, you know, US, UK, Australia, Denmark, and the Dutch and, and the Netherlands. Um, okay, and so I, 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 this is a graph of the public pension replacement rates. So what, what percentage of a, um, so the public pension replacement rate is the percentage of a median workers pre-retirement earnings are replaced by a public pension. Okay, and so, um, you know, in countries like, um, you know, Italy, it's around 70%. In countries like Denmark, it's only 20%. And, but in a country like Denmark, the private pension replacement rate is closer to 50%. So how much of a private pension, how much of a worker's earnings are replaced by a private pension at retirement? The other way to see this is just that public pension uh, graphing public pension uh, replacement rate and total pension assets. So a country like Denmark uh, or the Netherlands has a lot of pension assets relative to GDP when the public pension re replacement rate is low. And so I call 
you know, countries that are on the lower right side of this graph, pay as you go or pay go countries, and um, countries that are on the north uh, west side of this graph, I consider those funded um, funded pension systems. And so I'm just going to do a bunch of um, comparisons of these um, of these countries in terms of various characteristics. Now, the, the, what I'm talking about is based on a, on a paper that I did a, a couple of years ago in a presentation uh, that was published in the Journal of Finance, developed a theory of why you would have these differences. Um, the basic idea, as I've said, is that policies that promote pension savings and savings more generally will promote the use of capital markets and their development. So I present a model in which households have low savings, with low savings, don't want to pay the fixed cost of using the capital markets. And so what happens is that if you don't have that much savings because you're not forced to retire, save for retirement um, because you've got this public pension system, you keep your savings in bank deposits and it turns out in the extension of the model or in housing equity as an alternative to putting your money in capital markets because you don't wanna pay that fixed cost. Um, high savers keep as little as possible in deposits and housing equity and invest the rest in capital markets. And so you get a bunch of corporate finance implications, and I'll just run through some of, run through some of these um, gr uh, graphically. Um, as I've said, countries with more private pension funding are going to be more capital markets oriented. That comes out of a household decision around um, uh, where they want to put their money, while PAYGO oriented pension systems are going to be more bank um, oriented. They have less wealth, so they're they're just putting it in uh, more of it in deposits. And because banks have to invest in relatively safe assets to back deposits, um, it implies that the average firm in a pay-go country is going to be lower risk and have uh, lower returns. And because capital markets are less active, you can draw the implication, I don't model it, but that insiders retain a larger share um, of their firms. And that's what you see in the data here. I've graphed the share of corporate debt that is in the form of bonds. And you see that countries to the to the to my right, to the to the in the in the um, southeast um, have less bond financing. Those in the north um, northwest have um, uh, have more bond financing. So countries like the UK or US, Canada, Switzerland, Denmark, these, these countries um, uh, or Switzerland have, have, have more bond financing. Um, you have smaller firms in PAYGO countries. Um, and that, that comes out of, that's a, uh, informally comes out of, the, out of the model. Now, the two things are clearly related, right? I mean, if you've got smaller um, companies on average, you're probably, those companies aren't gonna bear the fixed cost of going to the, to the bond market. But one might ask the question of, well, why do you have smaller companies? It may be because bond markets are, um, are less developed and it's more, you're more focused on banks, which have to invest in, in safer businesses. And then you see here a very strong relationship between um, uh, insider ownership share percentages and um, the uh, um, public pension policy, whether the company is uh, the country is PAYGO oriented or uh, a funded pension plan. So that, that the bunch of implications that come out of the corporate um, finance perspective. What you see here is um, moving to the household side. This is um, household financial assets uh, in PAYGO countries are lower. And a piece of that is, of course, that um, they don't have as much in the form of pension assets, right? So um, this is relative to GDP. You see uh, that you know, in the US, for example, there is a very large amount of household financial assets relative to GDP. In the UK, Switzerland, Netherlands, these are all countries with funded pension plans. And then again, if you look at bank deposits as a share of financial assets, the model predicts that um, 
countries in that 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 households in paygo countries should keep more of their assets uh, in the bank because they don't pay the fixed cost of entering the capital market, and that's indeed um, indeed what you see. Um, Another implication uh, that comes out of this is with respect to housing equity. If you're not in the capital market and the capital market is not as a, a robust a market, um, the, if you have to own a house or you, know, you, you, you wanna own a house and you're looking to uh, get a return that's you know, more than just deposits, um, the, Alternative is to put it into housing equity and kind of what you see is that again countries in more pago pago oriented uh, households in more pago oriented countries put more of their wealth in uh, in housing in housing equity. The flip side of that is that um, households in funded countries with more you know funded private pension plans put are more leveraged and have less housing equity. So there's sort of a sense in which what's happening in countries like um, Denmark, um, which has a quite a high loan to value ratio uh, on their in their houses, is that essentially they're sort of borrowing against their house to fund their retirement and to buy sort of buy financial assets. In a sense, that's what's happening. Um, in countries with funded um, with funded pension plans, um, and if you think that the sort of returns to housing equity are low, capital market returns are higher. Th there may be um, some sense uh, to doing that. And then here you see that household debt in countries with funded pension plans um, are also higher. This is what I was talking about before with Denmark. Um, the household debt to GDP ratio is north of 125%. You contrast that to Italy, um, it's closer to 50%. And of course, a big piece of household debt is mortgage debt. Uh, and the Italians are, are less levered in their house than uh, the Danes. Okay, so those are the basic facts around the structure of the financial system. The summary is essentially kind of PAYGO countries, less, more bank oriented, uh, more inside ownership um, and households are less levered and have less financial assets and they're funding banks. It's also the case, by the way, in those PAYGO countries that a larger share of bank balance sheets are in um, business loans rather than in, uh, rather than in mortgages. And that makes sense given that um, those in those countries and PAYGO countries, households are putting in more housing, housing equity. Okay, so if we look now at finance share, okay, so the share of the GDP that is in the financial sector, what we see is that um, uh, it's there's a pretty strong relationship between the public pension replacement rate, the measure of how intensively PAYGO the country is and finance share, and it's a negative relationship. So countries that have more privately funded uh, pensions have larger financial systems. Another way to see that is just by looking at, by graphing um, finance share on private pension assets relative to GDP. And what you see is that countries that have more private pension assets have larger financial systems. Now it's possible, so one interpretation of that, so, so one interpretation of that is kind of along the lines of the model that I've been talking about. And, and in some sense, it's like a financial or capital market deepening kind of story where um, the, the, you know, the, the, the capital markets, the financial markets get bigger because there's more demand for assets. It sort of stimulates activity um, and finance becomes a bigger share of the economy. You know, another possibility is it's just fairly mechanical, which is that if you're um, paying asset managers to manage assets for your retirement, you got to pay them a fee, and that's going to go into the measure of value added of the financial sector. 
Now, if you look at the um, coefficients in this regression, it kind of it kind of implies that you know for each extra dollar, um, or each extra hundred dollars of um, of uh, of assets relative to GDP, um, the financial sector rises by um, 1.9 percent. Now, if you I mean, this is sort of back of the envelope calculations, but fees alone would be hard to uh, for fees alone to be explaining the data though that. Um, would imply, given the ratio between value added and revenues, um, which is about 50% in the asset management sector, it would imply extremely high fees, sort of on the order of 380 basis points, to explain this relationship purely on, a, on the basis of a mechanical relationship between um, fees and the finance share. So the interpretation, and again, look, this is all this is all high level, kind of like cross-sectional, not identified. I totally acknowledge that. That wasn't the goal. It's sort of the goal of the, of the study was to kind of get people thinking about what the role of, of, of the pension system um, is in, um, uh, in determining the structure of financial systems. Um, there are a bunch of other explanations one, uh, one might give that I, that, I can, that I can talk a little bit about. Um, but one kind of view of it, this is just one, one version of it. I think there's, there's other ones that you could, you could think about, um, which is that, um, it, it, the reason you're seeing this relationship is, is a form of capital market deepening. In other words, that given that you have fixed cost of asset management, one version of this would be given you have fixed cost of asset management, an increase in the demand for asset management services can lead to lower unit costs of asset management and equilibrium. In other words, you, you, you gotta pay for the, the fixed cost of running an asset management business. The more assets you're managing, the, the smaller unit fee um, you have. Now, the smaller unit fee that you, you have to charge, um, the greater incentive it is to, 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 for um, households to buy asset management services and it becomes a, um, a virtuous um, cycle. Um, and so that, that is one uh, version of the story. The other version of the story is that what has happened is that um, you know, the requirement to essentially save for your own retirement um, has um, led to a kind of stimulation of um, demand for assets, um, which has then gotten a whole security sector to invest in the um, process of um, uh, creating an infrastructure for security uh, issuance. And that again also becomes um, self-fulfilling. Um, there's some evidence on the effect of pension reforms very early. Um, work in kind of looking at, at changes in um, pension policy and how it affects the financial system or how it affects financial behavior. Um, there's a paper by Martin Kremers and co-authors um, that looks at um, pension reforms that increase private pension assets. Um, that leads to more indexing, so more low cost index funds um, which then has this competitive effect that lowers the fees on actively managed funds. Um, the effects are modest, but the pension reforms themselves are fairly modest. Um, this is something that probably plays out over a much longer period of time. There's a study from 2010 by Rockall and Nigaman, um, which looks at pension reforms across 57 countries. Um, these are pension reforms that, you know, kind of do more private funding and Finding some evidence that you that it stimulates uh, security issuance in the period after these pension reforms, and then there's an interesting study by my colleague Robin Greenwood and Annette Missing Jorgensen um, that, and I, I put I've copied the, the the relationship here, which looks at the effect of pension essentially a pension policy on asset prices in a country, and what they have on the x-axis is 
um, pension and insurance assets, less government debt. And of course, you know, long dated pensions and insurers want to hold long dated bonds. Um, the difference between pension and insurance assets and government debt sort of says what's the net demand for long dated assets. And what they find, and, and so countries that have private pension systems are going to generally have high levels of uh, pension and investment assets. Um, what is what's the effect on the on the on the yield spread between the 30 year bond and the 10 year bond. And the prediction is that if you've got more um, demand uh, for um, uh, long dated securities, um, the pension and invest and insurance assets are high, that yield spread is going to be tighter because the, the, the natural clientele for that 30 year bond is a long dated pension scheme and insurance. And in fact, that is that is what you see. Right, so in Denmark and Sweden, countries that we've been talking about um, that have um, large amounts of pension assets um, tend to um, have lower spreads between uh, the 30 and the 10 year bond. Moreover, they, they look at policy changes that make it more costly for pensions to hold long dated, um, long -dated uh, government bonds and find that that has a negative that has well, it raises the uh, the spread between the thirty and the ten year um, and the ten year bond. So this is so these are three studies. One of looking at the effect of pension policy on the cost of asset management. Another looking at security issuance, and a third looking at um, uh, at pension um, at, at at security pricing. And so I think these are three areas where um, more work uh, is needed. Um, these are these are really good starts. Um, I think this is a fertile a fertile area for for more research that goes kind of beyond the cross sectional to look at the effect of, of pension reforms. And there are there are other studies in other countries that have been uh, looking at this, but I, I think this is a, a potentially fertile opportunity. Um, there are some potential implications of pension policy for the evolution of pension systems. So, in one view. Will will ultimately have some kind of convergence. Um, if you think about the fact that you know in Europe, you have low birth rates and relatively muted growth, that is going to make it more difficult to fund PAYGO systems, um, and that could lead to a greater utilization of funded pensions, and as a result, more capital market growth, more demand for asset management, and so on. In the US um, and in other uh, countries that use funded pension systems, you have large cohort, at least particularly in the US, a large cohort of baby boomers who are now retiring or retired and will be disaving. Um, the next generation is smaller. And so one potential implication is there'll be a drop in pension assets and a drop in demand for uh, pension assets. Of course, there's you know, an international component, which is that there's demand for assets from faster growing economies that could amplify the effect in PAYGO countries as they kind of bring um, buy assets uh, in Europe, could uh, mute the effect in funded countries and act against the dissaving that's happened in the US. There's a, there's a international equilibrium that I'm not, I'm not really um, addressing here, but that's a, a thought uh, about their role. Um, and then it's also possible that tightened bank regulation and weaker banks in Europe could have a bigger effect on markets in PAYGO countries. Um, oh, I just lost my screen. Uh, hmm. Ah, here we go. Um, so, um, and anyway, tighten bank regulation uh, and weaker banks in Europe. I mean, given that funded countries already have a very developed capital market, the tight funding may not going forward have that much more of an incremental effect on, on markets, but it could be uh, a much bigger effect um, in Europe. So there's a possibility here of convergence 
There's also the possibility of divergence that, you know, it's difficult in practice to switch pension systems given legacy commitments. There's the political economy of shifting away from PAYGO funding is challenging. And then there's the, you know, issue that, you know, like the funded pension system is not obviously better than, than, than PAYGO. It comes with some, some costs as well, right? I mean, there's, um, you know, individuals are insuring themselves. Um, uh, whereas in the PAYGO system, you have generations insuring uh, each other. Um, and, uh, you know, probably some kind of hybrid models, you know, make the most sense. Um, but that shift is not going to be easy. Um, and so, you know, it's possible that there's very little movement uh, in Europe and in other uh, economies that are PAYGO oriented. And the financial sectors in countries with funded pension systems to continue to grow. And so you get divergence of uh, of financial of financial systems. And so, you know, look, I think this is dynamic. There's other theories of the structure of financial systems that feel more kind of static. You know, there's the there's the legal origin theory of Laporta and 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 others and and, and his co-authors um, that um, you know where you can't really change very much. Um, you know, there's theories of trust that could be um, at, at at play here. You know, belief in markets and so on. Um, but here, you know, there's a possibility of um, this 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 changing um, over time. Um, look, I, I don't think that the pension policy is the only determinant of, um, you know, capital market depth. Obviously, there are other things uh, at play. Um, you know, fees for uh, investment management are high in Europe, um, even as they have come down dramatically in the U.S. The average retail equity fund fee by one estimate is 175 basis points, retail bond fees 117 basis points. That's considerably higher than it is um, in the US. Distribution channels add a layer of cost. Um, you have direct uh, to consumer uh, is less prevalent, I think, in Europe than it is in the US. You know, my conjecture is that company sponsored retirement plans in the US stimulated consumer demand for mutual funds and now digital investment platforms such as Fidelity and Vanguard that have kept costs down significantly, particularly Vanguard. Um, and now you have uh, you know, widespread use of ETFs. You have trading now that is essentially zero cost, at least zero nominal stated cost. Um, and so the, the, the company sponsored 401k has kind of made a shareholder society, at least at the, at the upper income levels. And I think Europe probably needs a catalyst for greater competition in retail financial products to make the value proposition more, uh, more compelling. So let's think a little bit now about um, what this means around kind of financial stability uh, issues, these, these, two ver these two different systems. Um, and then I'll kind of talk about what um, has happened recently in the US and implications um, for, and, and what's happening um, during this crisis. Of course, the, the, the challenges in the two countries, I think, are kind of the opposite ends of the spectrum. The challenge um, in Europe is how to stimulate capital markets so European economies are not as dependent on bank credit supply. The challenge in the US is how to regulate capital markets and capital market intermediaries, such as mutual funds, uh, ETFs, hedge funds, asset-backed securities, so the U.S. economy is not so dependent on capital market credit supply. It is kind of interesting that I think of the global financial crisis as being driven by non-bank intermediaries. The response was to, you know, increase regulation of banks and to do very little around the regulation of um, these non-bank financial intermediaries. Um, and that may be just because we had the regulatory apparatus to, um, to, 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 to regulate the banks more, um, but it may also be the difficulty of, of coming up with a totally new regulatory regime, which I'm going to, which I'm going to talk about. So these are kind of two ends of the, of the spectrum. I want to talk a little bit about the growth of uh, capital markets, um, uh, in the U.S. and this is, 
just looking at this in the through the um, through the lens of um, uh, what has changed for non-financial corporate borrowers. So these are corporations. Where are they borrowing from? And what you see, you know, this is the, in the long history going back to 1945 to today. What you see is the growth of um, uh, bond financing. That's the the debt securities. Kind of takes a dip during the global financial crisis and then really comes back and recovers. And you see this very dramatic drop in borrowing from banks. So again, these are these are corporations. So this is not like the mom and pop shop, um, but bank loans are coming down uh, fairly um, fairly dramatically over time, and then non bank loans are um, are increasing. I want to unpack that a little bit. Um, these are these are rough estimates. The data isn't that great. Um, a big piece of the non-bank loans are actually these leveraged loans. So these are loans that are typically originated by a bank and then syndicated and sold to institutions. A bank will typically retain some share, but then sell off um, a peak, a, most of it to institutional investors. And the largest class of institutional investors are um, sponsors of collateralized loan obligations, CLOs, which are um, a form of um, you know, asset-backed uh, security. These are tranched structures that hold in them these leveraged loans. And so the senior tranches are relatively safe, the more junior tranches are risky and the equity is quite risky. Um, and you see that that has grown um, you know, quite, quite dramatically in the last um, 20 years. Um, and this is just saying that the share of leveraged loans um, held by institutional investors, these CLOs, uh, mutual funds uh, are holding a large share of these loans has grown dramatically. Um, so it used to be held by banks and now held um, by players in the capital market. And so if you kind of put them, those two pieces together, so debt securities plus non-bank leveraged loans, which, which can be traded in the markets. Um, it's, it's not a, it's a, it's an illiquid market, but these are, these are um, traded assets um, held kind of widely. Um, what you see is that about 80% of borrowing from um, uh, by uh, non-financial corporate uh, corporates is coming from either debt securities or non-bank leveraged loans. And bank loans as a share uh, has declined uh, quite dramatically. And then you've got these other non-bank loans, which um, has come down, right? So it, the non-bank loans was going up, but it was going up because of leveraged loans. Um, this is looking- to come to an end. Oh, come to an end? Yes, so we have uh, we're a bit over time already. So maybe uh, ah. another couple of okay, minutes. Okay, so let me let me just summarize. Okay, um, and just uh, well, so I won't do my my piece on uh, on fintech. Um, what I will um, uh, what I will say is that there are significant regulatory challenges to um, regulating these, uh, these 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 markets. I think that the uh, um, the pandemic has made very clear that um, these are um, I, I'll just uh, put it here, which is um, I'm sorry. Let me let me just do my last slide, um, and um, note that um, with apologies here. Uh, Let me do my last slide, which is that um, the COVID-19 pandemic was hard to predict, um, but the crisis revealed that while policymakers took steps to shore up the banking system post global financial crisis, they did not develop an adequate regulatory approach to capital markets and non-bank intermediaries. And some are gonna argue that we don't need ex ante regulation um, because central banks can intervene ex post to support markets 
Um, but I think the ability of these central banks to intervene in this case, and I'm sure many of you are familiar with the, the lengths to which the um, central banks went to stabilize markets, was likely enhanced by being in the midst of a public health crisis. And I think that macroprudential regulation of markets and non-bank intermediaries in the U.S. in particular, if done, you know, aggressively, would could rein in markets to create a better balance between banks, markets, and non-bank intermediaries. And if um, European pension reforms combined with other policies to promote markets take hold, we may end up with financial systems in the U.S. and Europe that look more like each other. Than, uh, than they do today. So thank you. And so thank you very much, uh, David. Uh, I'm, I'm happy that uh, you can now hear me. Sorry for the, um, the technical uh, glitch in the uh, beginning. Uh, so uh, now, of course, I, I don't have to tell you uh, um, what we are expecting, but uh, we, we've heard this excellent and uh, very inspiring speech. But what I would like to say is why this is actually a, a topic that is uh, of utmost importance uh, for the uh, ECB. Uh, so, um, uh, I mean, you know that uh, there has been um, a, a quite, uh, I mean, there have been many attempts to foster market-based financing uh, in Europe. And uh, there is this, um, this plan of the European Capital Markets Union. The progress on it has been relatively slow. Uh, but um, uh, in fact, it seems that the, the pandemic has uh, made the progress on the capital markets unit even more important. And uh, because the, the recovery will have to be financed partly uh, through capital markets, um, as uh, I argued recently also, uh, in, a, uh, in an ECB a blog post together with my uh, colleagues, Luis Guindos and uh, Fabio Panetta, uh, and in fact, uh, a lot of very fascinating work has been done at the uh, ECB, um, and you should, for example, have a look at the financial integration and structure uh, report, which has many, many interesting analyses on that. And uh, so, uh, actually, we're very much interested in, in learning uh, what would be the right uh, step uh, to foster market-based financing. And, uh, of course, you, uh, I mean, one uh, idea uh, that is uh, floating around is that it has uh, to do very much uh, with, uh, with uh, the pension system and uh, I think it's it's uh, it's very plausible. Uh, I mean, I should stress that uh, actually after the uh, the great financial crisis, also in Europe, we have uh, seen some uh, shift uh, like uh, from banks away from banks uh, towards uh, asset management. Uh, also, I wanted to mention that I mean, some of your arguments seem to rely on a lot of segmentation in financial markets, but of course, uh, the the European investors have access to very low fee. Um, um, uh, uh, like uh, ETFs and uh, and so on. Um, and um, uh, so uh, one important question that was raised actually by uh, quite a few people is, I mean, you have uh, presented very fascinating uh, correlations. And the question is, how do we get to this, uh, to this issue of causality? So can we be sure that by switching uh, uh, to a more uh, funded uh, pension system that uh, that actually uh, capital markets um, uh, will become more important uh, in Europe. So can we go beyond uh, the correlations uh, that uh, that you have shown? Um, then there, there is a question by uh, by Philip Lane, uh, who argues that it could be that the pay as you go countries also provide uh, more social housing. So maybe uh, it is um, uh, the, the imperative to buy a house is actually uh, weaker. Uh, then and now I'm, I'm actually shortening the question. So someone uh, uh, asked that, um, uh, so uh, whether um, private pension economies have a higher capital to labor ratio, and if not, whether that suggests that much of the assets in private uh, pension economies are actually bubble assets. So let me stop here uh, for now. And uh, uh, oh, actually, uh, we, uh, with respect to the uh, the causality issue, there was one question whether you have ever looked at countries that actually switched the pension system, whether uh, there uh, w whether you have done any analysis on that, because that may be a neat way to get closer to the causality issue. Right. Um, so those are all very good questions, and causality, of course, is you know a major issue, and and so you know I propose this not as um, causal. I mean, I do look at alternative um, explanations. There's, you know, the, the, the legal origin story. Uh, 
um, which, you know, actually, if you look at the data, the pension system explains more of the variations variables than does uh, legal origins. There's issues around trust. Um, there, there's, you know, um, you know, do you trust financial markets? If you don't trust financial markets, then you don't have a funded pension. So there's many things. I think causality is hard. There are people that are doing these studies that are looking at relatively small pension reforms and then trying to look at the effects. It's kind of hard to get that. I think a country that is probably worth looking at in more detail is Chile, which moved, um, I think, pretty aggressively to um, a private a private pension system. Um, but it's going to be hard to, um, you know, to do this because we 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 can't generate the, um, the the experiment. We can't just you know force a country to to move directly to this. So the the, the experiments are kind of local. Um, you know, there's there's a lot more one can do. Um, I don't think I, I don't think home ownership rates explain uh, this. I don't, you know, there's quite a bit of variation in home ownership rates. I mean, Germany might be low, but it's higher in other countries. Um, there, there there you know there are many many questions we could uh, we could we could dive into. Yes. Yeah, so uh, let me let me ask an, uh, another one that uh, came up in the uh, in the chat. Uh, so, uh, uh, what about the uh, current environment of low real uh, interest rates? So, uh, this, of course, implies that the private uh, pension funds are struggling to, uh, to deliver the high returns that are required to meet their uh, obligations. So, uh, do you think that in, in this environment, it's actually uh, much more uh, difficult to shift to a, a, pri a privately funded system? Yes, I mean, it, it surely is. Um, and, you know, particularly in a defined uh, benefit type of plan where, you know, you really have to meet those pension obligations and the low interest rate environment is really difficult. And what we've seen, you know, with some of these pension plans is they just, um, you know, take more risk to, to try to meet those uh, obligations, which obviously is problematic. I mean, there are many problems with moving to a funded system, including putting a lot of risk on um, on the individuals and on the households and, and on the generation. But yes, it's definitely going to be hard to do with uh, within the low real interest rate environment. Yeah. So I um, uh, some other questions I've I've got. So there's one uh, whether uh, the non pension savings in the funded countries are also more likely to be invested in asset markets, or whether this is limited to um, uh, to pension savings. So I think what I mean, non pension assets in uh, the pay as you go countries tend to be more invested in um, in deposits and in housing equity. Um, I'm not sure about the other financial assets. I think I might have something on that, but I don't I don't recall exactly. But I think the, the key takeaway is more to do with um, those non pension assets are in the PAYGO countries are in are in housing equity. And I think it's also, in, if you're asking about the funded countries, um, I think it's also more likely to be in financial assets um, and because they are more levered in their house. Yes, right. So uh, we have uh, two, two final questions. So one is when uh, we are thinking in Europe about uh, developing capital markets, uh, does it matter whether uh, we focus more on equity or on, uh, on bonds. That's the one question. And the other, that's actually a question that's coming back. So you didn't uh, answer the one on the bubble assets. So whether, uh, whether what we observe is actually driven by bubble assets. I, I don't think, look, I mean, it's hard to know when you have a bubble or not. I, I, I think if you look at the long, long sweep of history going back to 1980, what you're seeing is a growth of asset management during periods where you know assets are fairly valued, maybe assets are overvalued, maybe assets are undervalued. But I think the trend is um, one of um, you know growth of asset management, uh, and so I don't think it's very specific to um, a bubble. Uh, your other question was on the one on equity versus uh, oh. Well, it, I think it sort of depends to the extent to which um, you've got a funded, you know, it's a defined benefit plan or a defined contribution. And I think, um, you know, 
if you've got fixed obligations, you know, putting it in equity, but you're talking about for capital market development, which is more important, equity or bonds. I mean, the truth is that, you know, equity, I think of equity as a principal value of equity is as an exit for smaller firms to then really grow. Less important for more kind of established firms and debt financing is a much more important form of financing than is uh, equity, but equity is an important piece of the growth story. And so I, I think that that's, that, that is both are important, but for different sectors of the, of the corporate uh, world. Yes, I think that's actually a very important point, especially if we uh, think, of course, about the recovery also from the uh, pandemic. Uh, I mean, innovation and so on will, of course, uh, uh, play a very important role. Uh, but of course, well, I mean, what I take from your lecture is uh, that, I mean, if really the pension system is kind of the, the major driver of capital markets development, this would imply that uh, also in Europe, it's, uh, it's not possible to uh, kind of foster capital markets development in a, in a very short time, but that is uh, something which will actually uh, take some time. So it, uh, this may actually then not help us to, to deal with the, uh, with the uh, pandemic. Uh, so, uh, actually, I think we're running out of time. So, sorry again for the technical issues in the beginning. I'm happy we have a very good IT department, which fixed it. Um, so, we are very glad that uh, that we had you. Um, uh, you gave a, a great keynote speech, uh, uh, which raised many, uh, many interesting uh, issues. And maybe I just uh, hand over very briefly uh, to Luke. Uh, who is probably going to say some uh, concluding uh, words. But from my side, thank you very much, David, uh, for joining us. Thank you. I really appreciate the opportunity. So this is just to say thank you all for participating, for your questions, and we will continue tomorrow, same time. So same place. See you then. Have a nice evening. Bye.